Good. Oh, there we go. Hey, everybody. Uh, that's me, Steve Pousty, or Pousty, actually. Uh, and that's my Twitter handle. And actually, where you can, that handle is everywhere except Gmail. So any other place that you can think to find me, that is my handle, including IRC. That's a zero that has some long IRC history of not knowing how to claim your nickname. Um, so, and then Jeff is here. Je I'm with Red Hat. Jeff's with CrunchyDB. That's all the biology, I mean, um, biography you're going to get. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and hopefully all the biology you're going to get, too. <laughs> Woo! That would be bad news. All right, so there's some pretty simple goals for this talk. It's an introduction to containers, Kubernetes, and OpenShift. And then we're also going to watch the easiest replication and scaling in Postgres you've ever seen. Uh, I'm assuming everybody here has done at least a little bit with Postgres. But how about how many of you have actually done uh, replication in Postgres? All of you? Great. Almost everybody? So I hope, um, I hope Jeff's stuff impresses you. I, it impresses me. Uh, I want to do a little level set. How many of you know Platform as a Service? The Pivotal guys better raise your hand. Yeah, OK, good. Um, some of us know, think of uh, Platform as a Service differently, even if we think it. So I want to do a little level set on what plat I'm talking about when I talk about Platform as a Service. Um, so on the far left, where's the a AWS people? I saw them in here. There, in the back. So AWS. This is EC2, or infrastructure as a service. right? So with EC2 or infrastructure as a service, you get a machine almost instantaneously, and instead of racking and stacking and doing all that stuff, which is completely awesome. But for developers and uh, DBAs, what's not so awesome about it? And if you do it, I'm going to give you a hat if you actually answer the question. Or you can refuse that. What's, what's not so good about it? Yeah. No direct I.O., that is true. But the other thing that's even more annoying, and it's especially for me as a developer, is I still have to maintain a Linux box. Right? I don't actually want to do that. I want to write code, or I just want to run a database. I don't actually want to think about maintaining a Linux box. So on the other side is software as a service. Awesome. Who's the largest software as a service provider? That's if you were with your enterprise hat on. If you don't put your enterprise hat on and think about what could be the possibly largest software service as a provider in the world, Google, and which part of Google? Gmail. Everybody has about four Gmail accounts, and there's about six billion people in the world, maybe seven by now. So that makes about 24 billion accounts, right? So great, because you don't have to put up your own email servers, but not so great because you can't do anything with it as a developer, right? And so platform as a service is in the middle. So you get everything except for the part which either helps you host your, your database or your application server. And you can just write your code or do your database. So are we clear on platform as a service? Everybody good with that on the same page? I'm going to hand out my hats later. They, they make me stay between the tape. So everybody, has everybody here at least heard of Docker? Who hasn't heard of Docker? OK, kind of. You've, you've heard the name Docker, maybe? All right. So I want to do a level set on Docker and containers, because I think a lot of people have heard about it, but they don't really understand it. And unless you understand Docker and containers, you won't really understand the rest of the talk. So um, containers have been around in Linux for a long time. Who actually had containers before Linux? BSD, yeah, with chain root jails. And who, well, who's the other one? Solaris. Solaris, with Solaris zones. Right? Those were containers. So containers is not new technology. And Linux has had it for a long time. Right? Uh, the, what's different with Docker, and what Docker did really well, is coming up with a nice platform agnostic specification for what you're actually bundling up into the container and how to run it. Okay? And actually, the other part is the layered file system. So in Docker parlance, a, con a container is a running instance of an image. You make an image, and then you run it. Based on Linux containers, namespaces, control groups, usually called C groups, right? it combines file systems layers into a union layered file system. And this is, is important. Because what it means by a layered file system is you can take a Ubuntu or Red Hat image as your base layer, and everybody in your organization can use that. And then people can add different layers on top. If you patch the base layer, you'll actually end up, you just rebuild all the other images, and they all patch. Right? So you can all agree. This is great for sysadmins and developers as well, because sysadmins can hand off to their developers or DBAs, here's what I want you to build on top of. And then all the developer has to add is the stuff on top of the container. All right? And then it includes all the components necessary to run a process. And this is the big difference between this and a VM. And I think I have the next slide, which is, oh, we're not using this to go, are we? 
is the difference between containers and VMs. And this is a question I get a lot. Like, what's the difference between a container and a VM? Uh, every, I'm assuming everybody here has used a VM. Is that a good assumption? Yeah. OK, good. So on the left, you have VM, right? And in this case, we have VMs running on top of, a, on top of a, uh, another OS. It could be running straight on a hypervisor if you wanted to. But the di big difference is this part right over here, right? That's the guest OS. So each VM has its own instance of the entire operating system, right? Then you install your binaries, and then you have your application on top of it. In the container, what happens is, in the container world, everything is sharing the guest OS and the kernel. This is the Docker runner or the container runner. Then each container can bring its own binaries for whatever apps it needs to run. So it's faster because all you're doing is spinning up the container, not an entire operating system. It's more resource efficient because on this machine, you don't have three different overheads of the VM on it in itself. In a VM world, also, if you ask for four gigs of RAM for the VM or eight gigs of RAM for the VM, that's gone from the system, right? So you can keep adding VMs, and you'll exhaust the system and have to buy a new box. In the container world, what that means is, oh, this container can have up to four gigs of RAM, but it won't take it until it actually needs it. Right? So it's more efficient that way as well. It boots incredibly fast. And the other big difference, it's not a big difference, but the advantage here in our world is that you can have different versions of libraries underneath. Because all that's happening inside the guest OS, where the kernel is, is you're just bringing the kernel and some of the core system functions. Right? So if you wanted to put post, how many of you, I'm assuming everybody here has run Postgres on Linux? Is that a good assumption? Is it a bad assumption? Anybody running it on Windows? Anybody not raising their hand for fear of ridicule? Um, so in that, how many times have you run into RPM or, Deb, or what's the package manager for Debian again? I can't, apt, apt hell, right? Where there's a dependency between your, what version of Postgres you want and the version of some GCC version that you need for something else, right? You're stuck. You can't have them both on your machine at the same time. In the container world, what happens is Postgres is going to bring, be bringing its own version of the GCC libs, right? And it's only inside that container. So I'm going to make up GCC versions because I never track them because I'm a web developer. But I know I've run into GCC hell, so I'm going to make up the version. Let's say you're running Postfix on that server because you wanted to actually run outgoing mail, right? And then you also have, uh, you want to put Postgres on. And GCC 3.4 for Postfix, um, what's the word? Conflicts with, it's a, it's a tough word, um, it conflicts with Postgres because it needs GCC 4. In a traditional Linux system, you're stuck. You'd have to run two, that in two different VMs, right? In this world, it doesn't matter because they each bring their own version. You could actually run multiple versions of Postgres on the same machine, each in their own container. It's not a problem, okay? And so now I'll put on the Red Hat official hat. Uh, Red Hat is completely in on containers. Have, have, have any of you heard of Dan Walsh? He's the guy who put SC Linux into the Linux kernel. Um, he, I was at DockerCon with him, and he said, the only reason I really love Docker is because it gets us away from RPMs. <laughs> he said, I, you know, this is a better packaging format for the stuff we want to bring. So you'll see um, there's CoreOS. Have any of you heard of CoreOS? Right? And then for, uh, for Red Hat, there's Atomic. And these are both new versions of our, there's new versions of the operating system where it doesn't include anything except for the pieces needed to run containers. It's basically a stripped down operating system optimized for running containers. And I think, so yes, Docker has a lot of buzz right now, and containers do. It's not going away though. Right? This is not like Ruby. So, ap ap apologies, to, yeah, apologies to all the Ruby people in the world. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I thought I'd just start off with some sort of religious war. Nothing more fun than that, right? Uh, VR. VR. VR, exactly. No, Emacs. Um, yeah. yes. Nano. Nano, that's me, actually, because I can't remember all those keystrokes. Um, but I, I, the way I, I mean, what I mean about that about Ruby is that there was a point in time when the Rubyistas basically said everything was going to be Ruby and rail, everybody was going to be writing Rails. And now it's assumed its place as a normal language that not everybody's writing in, but some people write in and some people don't. Right? Docker, I don't think, is actually that way. I think actually the forward movement for Linux packaging will be more in containers and in that, that, that move. Okay? Some systems will still use RPM, but a lot more is going to be going to Docker as long enough. Okay, but containers are not enough. 
There are some problems with Docker containers by themselves. Um, they can't, you can't network between hosts, like between physical machines you can't actually, or VMs. You can't network between them using Docker. There's a whole, how many of you actually are using Docker? One, two, three, four. So, oh, you came by the booth yesterday. And we were talking about how actually Docker's great for development, but then actually trying to put it into production is actually quite difficult. It doesn't bring a lot of pieces of the infrastructure you actually need to run it in production. So you need stuff like orchestration, scheduling, isolation, all these things are, and by orchestration I mean like starting up different containers, who's running where, how they all work together. Scheduling is which Docker containers get put on which machines when. Isolation is, I start up a Docker container and it's my Docker container, I don't want your Docker container being able to see my Docker container and doing stuff with it, right? And so those are all needed, and that, we, with OpenShift we believe that comes from Kubernetes. Have you guys heard of Kubernetes? It came out of Google, it's an open source project, it's got its own foundation now like everybody does. Um, and it actually solves a lot of those problems, right? And the history is, it comes out of Borg and Omega. So all those people running Gmail are actually running on Borg and Omega. Everything inside of Google has been running on containers for a very long time. And the names of the projects were Borg and Omega. Google launches about 7,000 containers a second inside Google. So they bring that history of running containers for a long time to Kubernetes. And they came to Red Hat and they said, look, we want to open source our next iteration of this. Like, we're getting some good stuff, but we'd like to, as they've seen with open source, when you open source things, you get contributions you wouldn't necessarily get internally. And so we were one of the first people to jump on board with it. If you actually look um, at the Git repo for Kubernetes, Red Hat is five of the top 20 contributors, most of them on the OpenShift project. So one of the things that Red Hat, I hope, is known for is we always work upstream. This isn't some sort of fork where we're like, oh yeah, we've got Kubernetes in there, but it's a special little Kubernetes where we add these bits and it only works with us. Sorry, it's actually everything we do with Docker and Kubernetes is done upstream. But Kubernetes is not enough, right? There's, parts, there's more to what everybody wants and that's developer experience, managing applications and sysadmin experience. I'm trying to go through this relatively quick. I, I'm going through it, my goal with this was to give you enough background so you understand when you watch Jeff's demo later, because he's going to demo all the stuff. It's trying to not be too much propaganda. Do you feel like you're being propagandized? Am I doing okay so far? You do? Get out. Just kidding. <laughs> Just, it's a little bit, but I, I mean, I'm talking about, we're going to, I need, you need to understand the demo and the piece, how the pieces fit together. Yeah. But you need, a, this is Kubernetes now, and then the la OpenShift bits layered on top. The blue, Kubernetes, the orange is OpenShift, okay? So for those who, when you see Jeff's demo, you'll understand what's coming from raw Kubernetes and what's coming from us on top. So containers, each one of these little white boxes is a container. Does everybody understand that? Right, so that's a Docker image that's been spun up. In Kubernetes, the base unit is actually a pod. And a pod is one or more Docker containers. It's usually just one Docker container, but it can be two. Are you using two in a pod, or are you just doing one in all your pods? Just one. Just one. The reason why you would put two containers into a pod is they can share an IP address. In Kubernetes, everything gets IP addresses, right? So in this, in a pod, they can share the IP address, like these two would share an IP address, so they can talk over localhost if they need to. The other reason is they need to talk to the same file system. Like you, this would be, an, this might be Postgres, and this might be some agent that needs to look at the Postgres log files. Okay, so they can see the same files. In general though, putting two, pod, two containers together in a pod is an anti-pattern. I'm sure a bunch of people out here are already starting thinking, oh, so I'll put my web server and my database in the same pod. No, <laughs> terrible idea, don't do it. But it was a great thought pattern, just you're wrong. Um, <laughs> what happens is you want your web server to be able to scale independently of your database server. And if you put them in the same pod, you get a lot of traffic on your site, your web server needs to scale up and you'd actually end up scaling up your database server at the same time in a non-good way even, right? Because they would be looking at the same file space. It's just a bad idea. You want everything to basically be a pod, its own container in a pod unless you have some overriding reason that they live and die together, okay? So this is the base unit, pods. And Jeff will be showing some of these in a bit. Pods also have the ability to mount persistent volumes. So this is something that Docker doesn't provide as well. Persistent volumes mean this could be NFS, this could be elastic block storage, this could be Google Compute, this could be 
Ceph, this could be Gluster, this could be iSCSI. And what happens is the systems administrator for the cluster says, I'm making this data available as this name in the cluster. And then when someone spins up an app or a database, they make a claim into that, clus into that cluster and get some of the storage. Does that make sense? I see some puzzled looks. So if you were spinning up Postgres, the systems administrator who set up Kubernetes or OpenShift would say, I've made this iSCSI device available to developers, and when you spun up Postgres, your Postgres would say, I'm making a claim to that iSCSI device. I need 10 gigs of data from that iSCSI device, or a terabyte of data from that iSCSI device, and then that belongs to that pod. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing that it provides is services. So it, in the new world, right, everything's about horizontal scaling. Right? If, if you need to vertically scale, then this is not the right platform for you to use. So I want to make that clear from the beginning. I didn't make it. It's not the beginning anymore. I shouldn't say that. I want to make it clear that I'm not platform as a service all things. There are definitely applications and scenarios where you don't want to use platform as a service, where you don't want to use containers. If you're doing like high volume, high calculation uh, commodities trading, like you wrote a computer program with that, you're not doing that in a platform as a service. You're not doing that with containers. Right? That you want bare metal and you want to eke everything out of it. That is a bad scenario. That's an, it's because in platform as a service, there's lots of chatter over the network. Right? So if you need absolutely highest performance, you're not doing that directly in the platform as a service, okay? Or with containers. Well, maybe with containers. Um, so what services is, this is a load balancer and a proxy to any of, the any of the pods behind it, between one and n number of the same type of pod. And why would you need something like this? Well, if some, suppose you spun up Postgres, right? You would actually want your app server, your PHP, your Python server, to talk to the service not directly to the pod. Why? Because the pod can go up and down. And when it comes back up, it's going to have a different IP address. You could redeploy it. That could force a new IP address. The IP address for a service never changes. You could scale up the database. How would the app server know which actual one to talk to? If you have a service in front of it, you never have to worry about that. Because it just talks to the service, and the service handles the load balancing. Does everybody get what a service is now? basically a way to protect the applications from changes underneath. Right? And everything talks through services, almost everything. The only, like Jeff will not be talking through a service because he's actually clustering the, the Postgres. And so what happens there is they actually need to talk to directly to each other. There it actually matters. But for anything wanting to talk to the Postgres instance, it should come through the service. Services can also point outwards. So if you're running a big Postgres instance over here, I should, I should be nice to these people for a while. If you're running a big Postgres instance over here, that can actually talk through the service directly to it. So the developers are talking to this. They don't actually know if it's local in the cluster or if it's anywhere, but they always talk to the same endpoint. Any questions? I feel like I'm doing a lot of, and there's no questions, because I'm explaining it so perfectly. Yeah. Thanks, you guys. That's an awesome ego boost there. <laughs> I don't believe you. Um, the last piece that I'm going to talk about from Kubernetes is a replication controller. We wrap that in a deployment config, and I'll explain why in a minute. Um, a replication controller basically says, I want this many instances of this pod up. That's all a replication controller does. Right? So if one of those goes down, the agent says, oh, oh well, so this is what's interesting about Kubernetes. It's a declarative model of how the world is. So basically, you write a big JSON file, or you create a JSON file through some API calls, and then it puts that in etcd. Anybody heard of etcd? Right, it's a key value store, very good at replicating across, high availability. And the thing is, you say, this is what the world should look like. And then Kubernetes goes and makes the world the way it should be, right? which is different than a lot of other models where you say, make the world look like this, and it goes and makes the world look like that. But there's no consistent store that you can check against. What this does is it says, this is the way the world is. And the rest of the system keeps saying, does the world look like it should look? And if it doesn't, I'm going to make it look like that. Okay. So the replication controller keeps looking and says, how many versions, how many instances of this pod should I have up? Five? Oh, there's four up. I'm going to bring another one up. So that's all replication controller does. We, at op with OpenShift, we've added a deployment config on top because we find most people need more than just that functionality. With OpenShift, you can do things like, here's my source. Here's my source. 
I'm going to define how to build it, and then I'm going to actually deploy that, and I'm going to say how many versions of that I want running. So that's what comes from the deployment config. The other thing is we can watch a stream of Docker images. So let's say your sysadmins are in charge of the Docker images. You're running your own private Docker hub, which most people do. They don't use Wild Wild West Docker hub on their production system. What they'll say is, oh, we changed that Red Hat image. You can then specify in your deployment config any time that Docker image changes, redeploy. And the deployment config can then say, I want to bring one down, one up, right, a rolling deployment. It can say, bring them all down, bring them all up. You can specify that behavior. One of the really cool behaviors it can do is you can say percentage down and a time weight in between. So this is a perfect way to do an automatic canary deployment. You basically said, I want 10% down and 10% up and wait 20 minutes until you do the next 10%. So it'll actually bring the new ones up live, route, route traffic to them. You can watch those new ones. If they start having problems, you can roll back the deployment. But there's no manual, like I need to do the 10% or anything like that. So the last part is, Kubernetes doesn't have this, but we do is the route, which is the idea that you can actually route traffic back to the pods. These, by default, services are not exposed to the outside world. Okay, so that's all the architecture you need to understand. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, when you talk about the pods, um, is it like one big machine or is it like a cluster of machines? Yeah, so if this was a pure OpenShift talk, I would have had another slide that shows how it all works. Um, this is a, these run on multiple nodes. There's a master that does all the etcd and configuration stuff, and then every, all the pods run on different nodes. And you can set so, all sorts of rules for like if I scale up, what rules should I use to try to place on new nodes and stuff like that. So this is the end of all the OpenShift stuff. And Kubernetes stuff, I think. Yeah, so that's it. So you don't get to ask any more questions about OpenShift. Yeah. Software-defined network. Uh, okay. Sorry, OpenShift packages its own software-defined network. If any of you have tried to spin up Kubernetes before, one of the things you learn is you have to know a lot about how to do networking. And we provide that out of the box, so you don't, most people don't want to think about that too much. Yeah? This all seems to be very complex. How would you train uh, a systems engineer to understand all these things? Uh, a sysadmin or a, a sysadmin? A sysadmin? There's classes and stuff like that. It's not, I mean, the, in the new world, a DBA wouldn't have to know all this stuff. But a systems administrator would have to know the, all this stuff. They would set this cluster up, and then the developer has a different view into the system. It's, it's the same. Most developers, I mean, most sysadmins now, if they're doing their job right, know about Chef and Puppet and configuring networks and setting up clusters of machines. This is the same kind of ideas that they would be dealing with, setting up clusters of Linux machines as well. It's not, there's no foreign ideas in here, I think to most systems admin, it's just the practice of how to do it, right? Part of the whole another talk that I have that I won't give today, because Jeff needs to demo, is it's a different world now. This is more of a microservices DevOps world, right? So if your world is still like, I'm spinning up handcrafted VMs for each individual person, this is going to scare you, probably to start with, but if you actually take that on and learn something like this, it gets you much farther. It gets you, if you're still in the handcrafted world, I would, say skip everything in between and go straight to something like this. It doesn't have to be ours, but something like this. There's, Mesos also does container orchestration and does a whole bunch of stuff as well. It's kind of doing that whole Africa scenario where Africa didn't have landlines for the longest time and everybody thought they were backwards and now they have the greatest mobile penetration of anywhere, right? Because they just, it was easy for them to skip all the landlines and go right to towers. So same idea here where skip all the stuff in between, don't do the chef puppet, that kind of stuff in the middle. Just go straight to learning about containers and orchestrating containers. But there, yes, there's a learning curve involved. Nothing's free, yeah. except for my hats. Any other questions? Yeah. So, yeah, so um, no, it's got health checks and all that. The question was, is this like Erlang OTP? Um, it's more than Erlang OTP because Erlang OTP could only run Erlang programs, right? It's the same idea, though. 
So I, if I know OTP that, I don't know OTP that well, but from the way you describe it, it sounds like a way to monitor, schedule, and run your Erlang programs. Is that about right? Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing, only you can do it with Docker containers. It can run a whole bunch of other stuff. It does health checks. It does scheduling. It does isolation. It does a lot more on the container level. So you can use it with anything you want. But that's the same. If you're thinking of that as an analogy in your head, you, that's basically the, the right analogy. As always, analogy is a model, not necessarily the exact same thing. But yeah, that's a good way to think of it. I'm going to sit down now while Jeff does his part. You need to help me get this set up. I'm not switching over. Uh, sure, I can help with that. One second. <laughs> I think it was, what is happening is you're actually not mirroring displays. How do you, on a Windows machine, how do you change the displays? If he was using Fedora, this never would have happened. <laughs> one actually, I've seen a bunch of, uh, never mind, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, we, I started with one religious debate. Let's do another one. We need to bring up the display driver. Sorry? Next will start chilling my SQL. <laughs> Please. I haven't used my SQL in 18 years or something like that. Thank you. <laughs> was that a good for you? I, sorry, and you're stuck in that world of pain, or what was that? Yeah, so we want to say, there, duplicate, apply. Keep changes. And now, if you close this, there. All right. Wow. So I'm, I don't normally do dis demos, and especially on Windows boxes on a, a curved desktop. But here we go. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of uh, OpenShift. Uh, it, it's kind of a programmer type demo. Uh, it doesn't uh, have a lot of you know, splashy user interface or anything like that. It does have a web console. Um, so when you run OpenShift, this one's running on a CentOS 7 VM on a very slow i5 laptop. Um, so the only web interface that it has is the one you're looking at. And uh, if some of you have worked with the uh, previous version of OpenShift that's out there, uh, this sort of looks like that web in interface and end users would use this to provision or at least monitor uh, deployed OpenShift uh, assets, things like pods and services. So previous to this, I've set up something called PG Master. Uh, I've set up a project, first of all. There's a concept in OpenShift where you can create namespaces and those relate to projects. So I created one called PG Project uh, that you'll see. Uh, and it's the only one on the system. Um, there's, it gives you kind of a tab over here where you can look at what's deployed. And if you scroll through here, you'll see things like, well, there's something called PG Master RC. It's in a state of running and it gives you an IP address that that pod is running at. If you click on these things, uh, the most important reason I would go into here as a developer is to look at some of the detailed information um, that pertains to, in this case, the service. Services really don't, uh, aren't really anything I, I typically look at as a developer. What I normally do is I wanna look at um, the pod, and if you look at the pod, uh, what's interesting here is it will give you all kinds of information about it, and the most important things are environment variable settings. So when you create a pod, I'll show you the JSON template here in a minute, you can pass in environment variables into your pod, and that's a way for you to tailor the uh, startup and initialization of, of your container, essentially. So you can also generate uh, environment variables, and I'll show you how to do that in a second with a command. But what's important here is I've spun up, basically, inside this pod, a Postgres 944 with PostGIS extensions loaded. But I've, it shows you, interestingly, the, uh, the passwords. Uh, that are generated for this pod, and you could use those externally to log into this Postgres instance just like any other Postgres. But this is the kind of information that you can tailor as a pod developer 
uh, when you work with OpenShift, you can customize the types of environment variables that you want to pass in. And then when you want to consume these things, like if I was writing a Python or a Ruby uh, web app, <laughs> I would want to know these environment variable settings uh, and be able to look those up. And then you know, I'm able to access uh, a back-end database. One important thing is a pod, the way I've done these examples is a pod uh, rep is basically one Postgres instance. And that's all that's inside that pod. And a pod is always guaranteed to run on one physical node. So um, that's kind of the, the rules around pods. That's why you would not want a, a web app inside of a, a database, and all, both inside of a pod, because it's always going to just run on one host. So by splitting those concerns, you're able to run on multi-host and things like that. So um, this is all kind of you know the web front end to this. It's 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 what it is right now. I know that they're working. Red Hat's working hard on making this much more uh, robust in in terms of being able to provision um, custom applications on the fly. Right now, I use it just as a developer, just to kind of view things where maybe I don't want to go to the command line to do those things. Um, PG Master, in this case, is part of a master um, slave replication configuration uh, that I've got out there running. Um, and you can, you can browse these things. It's, it'll show you just more things like events, and I'm not using image streams for this example at all. But it gives you an idea of what, what's out there, and that's really the purpose of the web console. Now, um, the more, you know, when I typically work with this stuff, I'm on the command line. And I've got a project out there, a GitHub link I'll, I'll share with you back on the PowerPoint slides where all of this is at. But um, when you create a service under OpenShift, uh, it will automatically register that service uh, in an in a instance of a DNS server. So you can actually ping these service names and stuff like that. So uh, you can get to all of these services through normal DNS uh, name resolution. And the master slave replication example I did uh, depends upon that name resolution working. So OpenShift provides that orchestration for you uh, built in. Um, there's some commands called OC, and uh, this is how you typically work on the command line. So OC is like OpenShift console, I believe, or OpenShift command. But this gives you an idea, as a developer, what's actually running here. So you can say, like, OC. Make your fonts bigger. No, oh, let me make the font bigger. Uh, Control plus. Let's see if I can get this a little bit bigger. That's about as far as I can go and have it all on one screen. Is that a little better? Um, so anyway, this shows you um, the services that are running and the ports that are exposed through that service. You can expose multiple ports through the same service as well. So this is just that network proxy that gets built. If I do OC get um, pods, these are the corresponding pods, and it gives it uh, kind of a hash generated name in some cases when you use replication controllers. The master and slave are part of a replication controller scheme. And right now there's one, of, uh, one slave running and it's connected to the master. So if I was to get into that Postgres instance, you'd see that it's replicating. Um, now, the replication controller scheme is, is really uh, interesting in that the idea is you want to be able to automatically scale up uh, some kind of application. And in this case, I thought it would be interesting. Uh, a guy at Red Hat kind of posed a challenge to me a long time ago. He said, well, why don't you just make Postgres work with replication controllers? Because uh, I was doing some streaming replication. And that took me a little while to figure that out. But um, I'll show you the JSON templates for that in a second. But um, the idea is if I wanted to scale up that slave and have two replicas running, I would enter this uh, command. If I can type at 45 degrees angle. Hey, 
extra E. Oh. I can barely... Now let me see if I've got that command right. OC scale, RC, PG slave, RC1, yep. replicas equals two. And, uh, you know, after a while working with this, you'll, you'll kind of get those commands, but you're working a lot from the command line. So OpenShift, the way it works today is if you're developing with this, you really need to be comfortable working with the command line and VI, and this is all Linux. I wouldn't even try this on Windows or anything else. Um, I normally develop under CentOS 7 uh, or RHEL 7. Uh, or Fedora 2021. 20, um, it runs under Ubuntu and other Linux flavors, but you uh, will find yourself, if you get into this space, needing to know quite a bit about Linux networking, DNS, uh, and be comfortable working from the command line. So it's definitely uh, not for the uh, you know, people that aren't, aren't very comfortable in that environment right now. I think you would struggle with this, like if you didn't know VI or you didn't know basic Linux commands. So uh, that's where it goes. Um, if I hit that. I think it, one, just one thing though, when Jeff's talking about being a developer, Jeff's actually the person who's actually making custom pods and containers. If you're actually a web developer, it's a much easier experience. Yeah. You don't have to do nearly as much of the stuff that you're doing here. Just, exactly. Or a DBA, you wouldn't be doing a lot of that stuff either. You would just consume the stuff that he has. Yeah, if you're an end consumer of this, the experience I think will be really easy. And they'll, they're gonna customize that web console so that you can just point and click and do all this. But behind the scenes, uh, this is kind of why this demo is a little different. Uh, I figured people in this audience would wanna kind of see the, the nuts and bolts behind how some of this works. But by entering that command, it just gives you back a prompt saying scaled. If I hit this and show you, it, it basically what happened was it told uh, OpenShift and Kubernetes that I wanted two replicas, not one, of a particular, that thing called PG Slave. And what it just did is it provisioned a Docker container, Kubernetes did, and it's now keeping track and saying, I always want two of these. And then the way I wrote the Postgres pod is I, it always knows about who the master is in that replication configuration. So when it spun up, it said through environment variables and, and through host names, it, it said, I want to connect to the master and I want to become part of a streaming replication configuration. And I've uh, tailored the master Postgres configuration to allow that secondary slave to come in. So behind the scenes, if you look at the pod definitions and the Docker uh, container, you'll see how I did that in the example code. Um, but that's an example of scaling up from one to two slave nodes in a Postgres streaming replication configuration. So, And I'm going to ask Jeff to do something on the fly. We didn't practice this, so this is, now I get to make Jeff even more nervous. This is easily breakable, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. So can you actually change it to three and then switch, switch quick, as quick as you can to the web console? Yeah. I just want people to see how fast the replica comes up. So this is one of the advantages of using containers as, a com as compared to VMs. Because basically, once that Docker image is created, all he's doing when he asks for a new replica is actually just spinning up that, a, a, a Docker image is a compiled binary. So basically, all he's doing is spinning up another compiled binary. It's not all the other install stuff. So go ahead and hit enter there. And then if you go back to the overview, And then he goes down to the slave. There's the, there's the third pod coming up right there. So, there, it's up. So that's how long it actually took to bring up another replica. So I don't know how fast it is for most people when they do this by hand, but I'm guessing it's not one simple command, and I'm guessing it's not that fast. So that, I feel like I've met my promise at the beginning that this is probably the easiest way to spin up a replica that you've ever seen. Is that true? Two people said yes, three people, okay. I'll, that's a majority in my vote, so. <laughs> that's good enough. The, the thing is, you would wanna use this kind of technology if you wanted to say maybe run a Postgres as a service type of offering within your company um, or out on the web. Like let's say you had a, 
other use cases for this, like let's say you had a need for 50 analysts to get some kind of segment of some large data store and you put 50 people in here working on a problem and they each want their own Postgres environment. With this kind of thing, you could easily spin those up um, pretty rapidly and have them provisioned all of those assets. And, and that's one of the use cases that some of my customers deal with as like um, if you have a hurricane or a weather event come in and you have a bunch of people that need to work a problem or um, different things in the defense world where you might have a battlefield condition where you have to um, deploy a lot of analysts really quickly on a problem and uh, it's convenient to divide up data and a problem across a bunch of human assets then this kind of thing is really cool because you can just script this and run up and spin up 50 Postgres's like that. And I can also spin up ETL jobs if I wanted to write that pod definition or write that code. I could spin up 50 Tomcats or whatever. You can uh, get rapid provisioning really quickly that way. I um, think one other thing that this is useful for is most develop, all right, we have eight minutes, so I'm gonna say it really quickly. But I think most of us in this room are somewhere around my age, and we all grew up with the lie that databases always stay up. You need one app server and one database, and your app is good, right? And I think that we, a lot of us used, to, that's how I grew up. It was like you had a data, you were good because you put them on separate machines or something. And a lot of us grew up that that was an okay thing. This makes it really easy for developers to build really high available apps, yeah. right? Because it's very easy for them to spin up a master replica with multiple replicas that will still provide read without getting them into the whole, I've got to dig into all this arcane Postgres stuff that I don't want to. You, as, if you're a DBA or something, you can make the Postgres instances the way you want and then just give it to developers. So I think that's another scenario where it allows developers to just use Postgres and you as a DBA or a Postgres expert to set it up the way they, you think it should actually really be set up for them. And, and just a real quick, um wanted to show you that these examples are basically represented in these JSON files. If you want to learn how to write these things or how they work, um, there will be a GitHub link up here in a second, and all of these examples are in there. These use uh, empty dir, what they call empty dir volume provisioning as well, which gives the Postgres database direct access to the local disk that it's actually running on. Uh, that's obviously your highest performance I.O. I also provided a real simplistic example of running uh, Postgres on a, using an NFS mounted uh, volume using uh, the OpenShift volume management stuff. But that's really all I had here. If we switch back, I think we're gonna easily run out of time here. Um, question. No, you can't. So the, when you think of Docker, or when you think of containers, you think of them as immutable, right? They, once a Docker image is compiled, it's done. It's more like an AMI, right? So when you make changes into an AMI, the direct file system of a running EC2 instance, what happens if you shut down that AMI? Everything's gone. It's the exact same thing with a Docker container. So basically, yeah, you could, what you would have to do is set up this master-slave replication then with the new container you spin up, you make a larger claim to more resources, and then switch that to become the master or something like that, or spin up another master. Or... So, so does that mean that as a, as a person making these containers, you have like a bunch of different recipes for like the Postgres all the time? Where you could, it, it really gets yeah. like the identical your blogging sites and everything, but you want more sure. Yeah, that would be in the, the, the template JSON that he had talked mm -hmm. about there, where yeah. you could change those kinds of settings. And basically you, as an author of those things, by using environment variables, you're able to twist different knobs. You can set different. Like when I do these Postgres pods like this or the templates, um, there's actually, I templatize all of the PGHBA conf and PostgresQL.conf files and other things. And based on those environment variables, I'm able to plug in different values and set up Postgres certain recipes. Yep. And if That's it's in the perfect. environment variables, you can all, the environment variables actually live in the deployment config. Remember the deployment config on top? So what you can do, yeah, it's immutable, but what you can do is you can go into the deployment config, change the environment variable there, and spin up a new one, and it will take up the new settings. Right? So if you change the environment variable to be you know, more buffer RAM, then actually the next one that comes up will actually have that more RAM in it. Yep. 
Um, just an example of how I go about building, in case you want to play around with these examples. These are some of the commands you would do. You're going to clone kind of that code. It's all open source. Um, you run a make, which is going to build the uh, actual Docker container that gets spun up. And when you build that container, it's going to pull in Postgres 9.4 plus PostGIS uh, from the, the PD, PDDG um, RPM site or YUM site. And then you'll see here some of the basic commands you do, these OC commands. And that OC process is the interesting one. And that is a way of you um, processing a JSON template uh, before you send it to OpenShift. And that gives you the ability to do things like password generation and some other things that, that Red Hat provides is in that process step. So you can manually key all of that in if you wanted to, but you can get a dynamic nature of it. You'll quickly find that d writing big JSON template files is uh, problematic and it's very hard to debug. Um, there's different people working on ways of auto-generating that JSON through really nice user interfaces, and you'll see that over time. But um, I typically just get in on VI and code the thing, find examples that I like, and uh, you know, validate that it's valid JSON template and you're good to go. You can also do that in YAML format as well if that's um, something you want to do. You can also view all of the output in YAML or JSON output as well. So it's a pretty robust command, these OC commands. But this just gives you an example. And if you have your DNS set up correctly, <laughs> um, you'll be able to ping. You'll notice the bottom uh, uh, domain name, PG Project SVC Cluster Local. That's the default namespace that uh, it's the DNS is set up um, to, um, to resolve to. So um, you know, getting your DNS environment set up and stable is another challenge uh, if you're not really up on DNS management. Um, now, what I could do is, well, I think I have two minutes, is there's this project that we've done uh, called CPM, Crunchy Postgres Manager. This is currently not running on OpenShift, though. It's just a pure Docker play. Um, and I've written this probably over the last year to um, take a lot of concepts that OpenShift does, but I'm doing them directly by interacting with the Docker API. And this is probably what I would see is the, is the long-term goal for a Postgres Docker-based management tooling. Um, I'm about 25% done porting it to use the OpenShift APIs instead of the Docker APIs. Another open source project, this one goes, um, goes a ways out there into administration and monitoring uh, and provisioning of uh, Postgres. It's written in Golang, um, and then the front end is written in AngularJS, um, and it supports the, the current uh, 9.4 Postgres. So just real quickly, uh, I think I've got a minute. Let's see if I can switch over. So this scrunched together user interface uh, really needs to be on a wider screen. But um, this is kind of, uh, 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 there's six or seven Docker containers behind here that run as daemons. Um, when you log into this web interface, the idea is to give a person the ability to manage and view into all of their Postgres deployed assets. This is a, a, a really basic health check here that tells me whether my Postgres containers are up and running or not. And if it's red, it's down, basically. Um, real simplistic, but it does have the ability to, um, over time, I'm going to add much more uh, capacity planning type metrics into this health check. Uh, there's a project window here. Allows me to, def to uh, divide up all of my Postgres assets into different projects of however you want to name them. Um, there's three types of objects that I deal with right now, clusters, databases, and something I call proxies. Proxy is a container that's kind of a shim that allows you to talk to a non-Docker-based Postgres. 
and this one is running on my local machine here and monitoring is done on the right side here and I've written various types of monitoring plugins. Let's see if this one works. Um, this is a very, uh, just shows database size. And this is what's happening here is there's something called CPM Collect behind the scenes here that's monitoring all of these deployed Docker containers and it's collecting different types of metrics and it pumps those into something called Prometheus. And Prometheus is a time series data store um, out of Germany that's really interesting uh, for, so for basically just collecting and allowing you to query on uh, time series based data. I did database size just as an example of things that I could do. Um, so I wanted this tool to be able to, to not only manage Docker based assets that I provision up through this tool, but also uh, existing uh, Postgres instances that you would have. So I'm officially out of time and I could probably talk for 30 more minutes on, on CPM, but sorry, I'm out of time. So. So the last statement for me is just, uh, this wasn't supposed to be a complete open shift propaganda talk. I hope it didn't feel like it. Most of it, what it was, was to get people, I, I figured this audience was relatively new to containers, and that's what we were trying to show and the ways to run them and some of the advantages they bring. I hope, uh, did people feel like they got that out of the talk? Okay. Um, you will try, I'll try, you remember I'm, no. Oh. I'm the Steve Zero again, and I will try, I don't know where the slide deck is. I will try to send out a tweet with PG Open in it that has a link to the slide deck in case you want to see it. It's just a Google slide deck. Uh, any last questions? Yeah, Josh. The question, so the question for those watching at home is, was that a, are you using actually different images for the master and the, sla the replica, right? No. You want to hear, do you have your, here's your mic still on? Can we turn on two? <laughs> so anyway, it's the same image, but um, I manipulate it through environment variables to tell it whether it's the master or slave, but it's the same Docker image. And it's out on Docker Hub too, so you can pull it down. It's called, uh, if you go to crunchy data slash crunchy dash PG, you'll pull down that image. And then the source is from that GitHub link. How do you visualize it? Is it just a base backup of the master? Yeah. Yeah, it just does a PG based backup of the master. What's that? Read-only? Yeah, the slaves are read-only. And so that's one of the other benefits of the services. You would probably have two services, right? A PG, the slave and the master. And so all the read operations can go through the slave and the master can be for just the write operation. And that's, that's the way the examples work is there's a service for the master and then there's a service for all of the replicas. So that service load balances evenly across the replicas. Now, CPM, the tool I just showed you, it goes a step beyond this in that it provisions a PG pool container and sets it out in front of the CPM provisioned um, clusters. So that's what I do with CPM. That's what I would like to do, eventually we'll do with OpenShift when I get the time to, to build that pod. Now that's a separate image, the PG pool. Uh, I bundle that as a separate Docker image. Oh, and then if you're here, Dave is in the audience and he now works at Crunchy and he works on What's it called again? Uh, backrest? Yeah, so if you would like to see a Docker image for backrest, go bother uh, Dave right after this talk. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the plans is to take things like, what I didn't get to show you is like PG Badgers integrated into CPM. I wanna take other Postgres tooling like that, wrap them in Docker containers, and then integrate them into CPM. So things like PG backrest is, is a perfect example of something that I can wrap, it, wrap that in a Docker container. I can then do a little bit of wiring into CPM, and then I can do automated backups of CPM databases using like uh, backrest. And that's not an OpenShift thing, that's a Docker thing, right? So the, the nice part about that is backrest comes ready to go, right? It's not like you have to do a whole bunch of configurations. You just take the Docker image, you say this is the database you're backing up, and it's ready to go. 
right? You set some environment variables and be set. Josh, last one. Go, you. Kubernetes does not come with software-defined network. The OpenShift brings the, the software-defined network. That's Google, because Google runs it in their cloud. They don't need a software-defined network. The yep. OpenShift brings it. I don't know if you've done any performance testing. Though. I've not done any performance testing. The only thing I use it, uh, right now is the DNS provisioning so that whenever services get created, OpenShift automatically creates a DNS, local DNS entry. That's the only thing I currently use. Um, the SDN product that they have uh, I've not gotten into yet. It's open vSwitch. We're basically taking open vSwitch and putting some customization on top of it. So you can read open vSwitch performance with databases, and that should be relatively similar. Thanks, everybody.